So I'm Andrea Goff. I'm a librarian in the Reader Services Department here at the Central Library. We're pleased today to partner with Old Growth Northwest and Gay City to present today's free Gay Romance Northwest Meetup Conference. I'm so excited y'all came out today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So for the library, today's conference is part of our Fall Seattle Rights programming series. This September through December, the library is offering 29 free workshops on the craft of writing and the business of publishing. Taught by local writers, we'll cover topics such as how to form a productive writing group, how to start your novel, conflict is the machine of fiction, nuts and bolts of self-publishing, and the art of the query letter, plus much, much more. Uh, we have brochures up in the fourth floor book fair. If you are interested, you can grab one of those. I just gave my last one out, otherwise I would show you what they look like. Uh, for their support of Seattle Rights, I would like to thank the Seattle Public Library Foundation and Amazon Literary Partnership. That's all I have to say, but I hope, thank you, I hope you'll join me in welcoming the organizer of today's conference, Tracy Timmons Gray. <laughs> Thanks everybody, it's for real, can you hear me okay? All right, just gonna maybe ask that occasionally throughout. Uh, be honest, I'm a little nervous, so please forgive. Uh, even though this is our fourth year, oh my God, it's our fourth year. <laughs> uh, I got some slides to go through before we get to our amazing keynote address. First is, um, I wanna talk a little bit about what is Gay Romance Northwest? What the heck is this program? Why are you here today? Uh, Gay Romance Northwest is a nonprofit volunteer run initiative that is part of Old Growth Northwest, a Seattle writing nonprofit that focuses on building uh, resources to promote a diverse community of writers and readers in Seattle. They do that through programs like teaching writing classes in the Monroe Prison, free community writing circles, they do writing workshops, they have a journal, and they have Gay Romance Northwest. And what is our mission? Our mission is about celebrating the awesomeness of LGBTQ romance fiction. And we do that, well, first, why do we do that? Well, A, it's awesome, sorry, I had to put that up first. <laughs> uh, but why we do that is we have these amazing stories, these amazing LGBTQ love stories, and they're not always easy to find. I don't know why. Uh, there's thousands of them, thousands of these stories, but we, we can't find them in bookstores. I can't go to Elliott Bay and find the amazing selection of queer love stories. And they can be hard to find in libraries. And it can be really hard if you never see positive uh, views of love, queer love, and you are a queer person. And uh, so we do, we do the, we want to do the promote that, we want to do the work to celebrate queer romance fiction. And we do that through a, a few different means from public events, uh, free public reading events like last night at Hugo House. We do this through this conference. Thank you all for coming today. We do this with community book drives like what, who everyone has been donating books to Gay City for the Gay City LGBT Library, thank you so much. Uh, and we do this through advocacy. And so that's kind of our mission. That's why we're here today. But before, uh, we also wanna give a quick shout out. This is our fourth year, we started in 2013, but this is our first year as a full partnership with the Seattle Public Library and Gay City, Seattle's LGBTQ Center. And we wanna give a quick shout out to Gay City and SPL. <laughs> It's truly a dream come true to be able to work with Seattle Public Library and Gay City on this event. When we started, we were very scrappy with just this idea, and it's really amazing that after all these years, we were able to work officially with the library. So we're really thankful and grateful for our partners uh, in Gay City. Uh, quick shout out also to our sponsors. Our sponsors for this year are Blind Eye Books, Dream Spinner Press, Harmony Inc. Press, Less Than Three Press, Riptide Publishing, and Pride Foundation. Really thankful for our sponsors. Uh, this is our first year that is not only a partnership with uh, Seattle Public Library and Gay City, but it's also the first time that we've been able to be a free conference. We are the only queer romance free conference in the United States, and I'm really grateful for our sponsors and our partners for allowing us to do this. So thank you so much to them. <laughs> I do have some opening remarks, and as I promise, uh, don't worry, they won't be too long, but I'm gonna get my cell phone to make sure how I'm doing. All right, 109, doing pretty good. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so I, I mentioned a little bit about why we're here, and that's because even though, again, as I mentioned, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of queer love stories, they are not hard to find, uh, but they are growingly more easy to be visible. And why is that visibility is really important in order to help normalize and promote acceptance of queer love stories and queer love and queer lives. Uh, a story that we told at our 2014 conference was when Amazon updated their website, their romance storefront, to include LGBT romance stories. That was a really big deal because when they did list it as one of their categories, when they did that, you suddenly saw also the numbers of how many books were invisible up in the, on the store up until that moment. So in that one moment when they did it in January 2014, when they revealed it on the website, there was 12,000 titles in the store, and that's what was invisible before that. And those are the stories that we're not seeing until we make them visible. And so we did a thing where in, it's great to see um, how much progress we've made from September 2014 to September 2016. In September 2014, there was about 14,000 queer romance titles, and now in September 2016 on Amazon, there are 34,000 queer romance titles, and that's really amazing. And you should all give your hand, because that's a lot of books to write and a lot of books to read. <laughs> but that kind of visibility of, of being, not just putting it in the store, but being visible in the store is so monumental and so important for the increased uh, progress of not just uh, queer romance awareness, but also, again, normalization and acceptance of queer love and queer lives. Other ways that we can promote community visibility, ways that we've been doing that is, is holding and going to uh, reading events. It's really valuable. So if wh whether you're going to our events or events at Gay City or the events at Seattle Public Library, events at Hugo House, or whoever's hosting events, uh, checking them out is really helpful, and that shows demand, and people will make more. Uh, I, what I like to do is uh, I like to invade other conferences. It's really fun. <laughs> Uh, so we were at Geek Girl Con before, and we will be at Geek Girl Con next month, if anyone wants to come check us out. We'll be having a panel on queer sci-fi and fantasy. And then another thing we, uh, we think is really valuable is building up community LGBT libraries. Whether it's in Seattle, we have the amazing Gay City LGBT Library that has thousands and thousands of queer books. A uh, wonderful free resource that anyone can access. And also we did a drive for Lambert House, which is a queer youth organization building up their YA library. Uh, these kind of initiatives, whether you want to do it in your own hometown, are really valuable to ensure that we have access to these books, especially for people that need it. Also, a big shout out for the community. One of the biggest moves also to increase, uh, increase awareness is making library requests. So going up to your library and saying, I really want to read this book, I wish it was in the collection, and, and submitting a library purchase request with your library. A lot of libraries allow this, the patron request. And because of the work, not just of patrons at the Seattle Public Library and also the great work that the Seattle Public Library has done itself, uh, they have added more than 500 LGBTQ titles since 2013 in the library collection that you can now access for free, including by many of the authors in this room right now. So thank you so much, Seattle Public Library. <laughs> hmm. Oh, hey, we have our own book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> This is, a, for those that don't know, at Gay Romance Northwest, uh, we released our own book at this early September, uh, Magic and Mayhem, uh, fiction and essays celebrating LGBTQ romance. Uh, I gotta be honest, we did very little to make this book exist. Uh, it was all thanks to the hard work and volunteer work of three amazing editors, Samantha Durr from Less Than Three Press, Amanda Jean from Less Than Three Press, and Nicole Kimberling from Blind Eye Books, pulled their efforts together to organize this charity anthology for us. And we have an uh, amazing crew of authors that contributed new stories, and we also have all the keynotes from previous conferences. Uh, it's, a, it's being sold upstairs in paperback, uh, so you can check it out on the book fest. I gotta be honest, since one of our tenants is financial access, the ebook is way, way, way cheaper. So just throw that out there. Uh, if you're interested in checking it out, it is available. Um, and thank you to Amanda, Samantha, and Nicole, and all the wonderful contributors for making this book come become a reality, and for us, probably one of the proudest moments of us is it was an actual physical embodiment of our mission of celebrating queer romance, because inside includes stories of gay, uh, gay romance, lesbian romance, trans romance, asexual romance, genderqueer romance, and bi romance. So it's so amazing to have, to, to show the vibrancy and complexity of the queer romance spectrum within one book. I'm really grateful for it. <laughs> How am I doing on time? Okay, I'm gonna, 
our theme this year, as you can see in your program, is Love Transforms. And I gotta be honest, we actually had a hard time coming up with our theme this year. And I'm probably not gonna say my next part uh, really articulately, so I'm just gonna warn y'all ahead of time. Uh, but we had, it was a hard time, it's been a hard year. Uh, it was really easy last year because last year we were all like, hashtag love wins, woo, hashtag love wins. It was like this exalt and exuberantness from marriage equality being passed in June 2015. So it was like this tide of happiness and love and acceptance. And this year, it's been a, it's been a little harder. Uh, I gotta say, first, we have to give a big shout out for our, our community members who fought hard to trounce the bathroom bill in June in Washington State. Big thank you to organizations like Gender Justice League, Pride Foundation, and so many, so many people that fought to make sure that that didn't go hap that didn't go forward. So, but as we know that it. It's happened in other states, and it's terrible when you have a part of your community is happy, yay, 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 we can get married, but another part of your community is missing a, a human right, a civil right of just going to the bathroom. And so if you have one part of your community that is being treated unequally, you are all, we are all treated unequally. We do not have equality right now. We do not have freedom if we do not have freedom for our transgender siblings. And so. We still have a lot of work to do. I'm so grateful that we have gotten here in Washington, but we, until we get every state to turn over their laws, their homophobic, transphobic laws, we're not there yet. And so that's one part that made us ponder as we were going into this year, celebrating queer love stories. And then the other part was, was Orlando. It was a terrible, terrible time. And these, these laws, these actions, really reveal how much homophobia and transphobia exists and that we have to fight against, especially for pr protecting safe spaces like like, like the clubs, places that promote safety, welcome, love, especially for our queer communities of color. So I had a lot of difficulty <laughs> thinking about what we were gonna do. And uh, if you see Carolyn, who's running around today, Give her a shout out because she came up with this year's theme of love transforms. And how, how through our actions together, we can transform the world to be a better place. Whether, and I know many of you may not think of yourself as literary advocates, but you are, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you are writing a story, or you are publishing a story, or you're starting your own publisher, I know there's a few of you out there in the audience who did this, or you're reading a book, or you are requesting a book at the library, or borrowing a book, or writing a book review, or just telling your friends about it, each of these single actions are all part of advocating for queer love and queer lives. And I'm so grateful for you, for every single action that you have done, and we're going to have to keep doing it. We have a lot of work ahead. And, but I believe truly that together, whether you are in the queer community or whether you are an ally, because we need our allies, that together we can transform the world to be better through our love, through our actions, through our lives. And I hope that you will walk with us on that. And that's a little bit of what my queer romance dream is, is us to do that together. I thought that was a pretty sweet segue to our keynote. <laughs> 
uh, our keynote today is what is your queer romance dream? And uh, as I kind of set it up, can I please invite our three amazing dreamers that'll be sharing their dream. Please come on down to the, grab a seat. So this is our, this is a building off of a little bit what we did last year when we did an audience activity. And one of the questions that we asked audience members to share was where do they want to see queer romance grow? How do they want to see it grow? Where do they want to see it do? And people wrote down these great answers and we thought about this when we were going into this year, and we wanted to pull that apart more, and we wanted to dream bigger. And so this is why we're doing, we're setting up our keynote around what is your queer romance dream. And we're so happy to have these three beautiful dreamers with us today to share what theirs is. And they will be turning it back and uh, sharing more with the audience after. So, but today our dreamers are Richard Compson Sater, Alex Powell, and Toby Hill Meyer. They'll be coming up and sharing. And uh, can we please give them a big hand? Please welcome Richard Compson Sater. I've never been called a beautiful dreamer before. Thank you, Tracy. I've been an avid reader ever since I learned how, nearly 50 years ago. My favorite stories featured characters I could fall in love with. In my teens and early 20s, I looked for people like me in the books I read. There weren't many. Those I could find weren't very likable either, more often the object of pity or ridicule. So I had to make do with characters who merely possessed traits that I would seek in a mate, men who are charming, handsome, witty, and smart. So I fell in love with Hank Morgan in Mark Twain's Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, uh, with Lord Jim in Joseph Conrad's novel of the same name, Dick Diver in F. Scott Fitzgerald's Tender as the Night, Rhett Butler in Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind, None of these characters was intended to be gay by the author, perhaps, but in my mind, with the right kind of lighting and maybe a bottle of good wine, <laughs> they might be persuaded. My favorite character, the most perfect man in all of literature for me, is lawyer Atticus Finch in, in To Kill a Mockingbird, of course, which I read for the first time in junior high school. Atticus Finch might not be gay, but he's not presented as decidedly straight either. He's intelligent, generous, compassionate, committed, loving, and very single. And he needs eyeglasses, which is an endearing trait because we all need a weakness or two. I fall in love again with Atticus Finch every time I reread To Kill a Mockingbird. In my mid-twenties, I became aware that books actually existed with same-sex characters who weren't simply comic relief or lost in the background. The flawless Charlie Mills and Peter Martin in Gordon Merrick's The Lord Won't Mind, for example, or Coach Harlan Brown in Patricia Nell Warren's The Front Runner. Such books were encouraging but I still hadn't found exactly what I wanted. An actual romantic novel with no excess baggage, just two men conquering all for love. A book where their hero could be an average guy, like me, and the other hero could be Sam Elliott, and we could live happily ever after. <laughs> it didn't occur to me until the turn of this century that I could actually write such a novel myself. In 2003, I was a major in the U.S. Air Force with 17 years of service, most of it under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, deployed to Afghanistan for Operation Enduring Freedom. At the end of the long work days, I needed something to do, something to take my mind off the war. So I started writing a short story about a closeted young officer, lieutenant, who develops a most inconvenient crush on his boss, a brigadier general, 
hiding behind bluster, a magnificent mustache, a pipe, and a big secret. My short story grew longer and longer, and 13 years later, it has become my first novel, Rank, which will be published in November by Bold Strokes Books. Thank you. So for the present, that's a dream come true, but uh, we're, we're here to talk about the future. Everyone has heard of the Harlequin romance. The last time I checked, there are 19 different Harlequin series, over 100 new titles every month. The categories offer a hint about the content, intrigue, historical, western, medical romance, suspense, some are chaste and heartwarming, others are steamy and suggestive. The heroes and heroines these days are multicultural and multi-ethnic, but they're one thing I'm not, and that's heterosexual. So my dream is 100 titles a month that cater to the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender reader. I want to grab a gay romance mass market paperback by the checkout stand at Safeway and Rite Aid. I want gay romance novels to be shelved in the same rack as the heterosexual romances at the bookstore, not relegated to an alternative lifestyle section, if there even is such a thing these days. Most importantly, I'm not 35, I'm 55. The desire for romance doesn't stop just because you leave your 30s behind. Even in our newly enlightened world with same-sex marriage legal in the US and elsewhere around the world, with military service members permitted to serve openly and more and more rights guaranteed to non-heterosexuals, even with Amazon and Google where I can search for and buy anything I want, I still have a hard time finding Sam Elliott or any older man in a same-sex romance. I guess I'll have to keep writing them myself. Thank you. Hello everyone. The question was presented to me, what is your queer romance dream? I have so many dreams for this genre that I almost didn't know where to start. Where to begin when you have all of queer romance to dream for? So I decided to start where I started and where so many of us start dreaming, when we are young. When I was young, I dreamed of having something to read that truly reflected who I was. Most young kids like me had the same dream, but the search was more difficult for some than others. I didn't know then that I was gender fluid, but I knew then that I was something different, and I searched for the answer in books. But no matter how much I read, and I read a lot, I never found the answer. I wonder now how many of us did the very same thing that I did, search for the answer only to find that it wasn't there. How many of us couldn't find ourselves in the books we read? How many of us found maybe one or two characters to look up to, only to have them murdered later on in the book? I'm sure you remember the feeling that it gave you. That's one of my queer romance dreams. I want young adult and teen fiction that has queer characters from across the spectrum so that young questioning people can find their answer in the books they read. Not only that, I want those queer characters to lead exciting adventure-filled lives just like straight cis characters do. We deserve that, to have our space pirate adventures, to be the main romantic pairing, to live fulfilling lives. I love all of our queer young children, and I want them to grow up knowing that they are accepted. That leads me to the rest of us, those of us who are no longer children, because we need queer books as well. My next queer romance dream is that our genre grows and flourishes. I want to see our queer romances on the shelves in bookstores and in libraries. I've already seen this happen in small independent bookstores and in tiny libraries dedicated to the LGBTQI fiction but I want to see it everywhere, from the smallest bookshop to the largest chain. I want to see our fiction on the book bestsellers list, because I know for a fact that our books are just as good, if not better, than mainstream books. To be honest, I find most of the mainstream culture books boring and lacking in imagination. And why is that? Because queer books are so much more fulfilling to me, with more interesting characters and more imagination put into plot lines. So yes, I want to see our books everywhere, I want to be walking by a big bookstore and I want to see my favorite author's book on display. It's not just for us that I want this. 
My, queer romance, my third queer romance dream is that I want everyone to read our queer romances. I want it to be just as accept acceptable to have a queer romance in our reads as a straight romance. Not only acceptable, I want it to be normalized. So very often queer romance is seen as an adult genre, not because of the sex, although there may be much lovemaking going on, but because of that fact the characters are queer. Queerness is seen as inherently sexual, and I want that to stop. The genre has already changed since I was a young teen, who had maybe one queer character to look up to, and they always died or had something tragic happen to them. The genre has already grown and become prevalent in the last few years, more than I had ever dreamed as a young teen. Now I can find books with bisexual protagonists, with genderqueer and trans protagonists, with asexual protagonists, which is amazing because I couldn't even find a novel with a gay or lesbian protagonist when I needed them so much in my youth. That's not the end. I may be a dreamer, but my ultimate goal is to see all of our queer romance dreams become a reality. How can we do that? One of the things that you can do is something that you are already doing. Read queer romances. Read as much as you can and then more. Authors like me need people out there to read your, our work because we would be nowhere without our readers. Read things that you love with tropes that make you smile. And maybe read something that you haven't tried before. Read something that makes you just slightly uncomfortable and maybe you'll end up loving it. What else can you do? Review our books. Spread the word of how queer romances have changed your life or made you smile, laugh, and cry. Tell all your friends to read queer romances. Lend them your copy to give them that little push to try more. Don't stop there. We've discussed this before at previous conferences, but you need to ask libraries like this one. Where is your queer, queer romance section? Ask your local library for more queer romance books. Put in requests for your favorite author's books to be put on the shelves. Ask your favorite bookstore the same questions. Questions like this might make people uncomfortable, but we need you to be brave and ask just the same. You see, we are not powerless. More now than ever before, queer voices have raised up and been heard. People know about queer issues. They see it on TV and read about it in magazines. So what I need all of us to do is raise our voices and let them be heard. All of us are counting on you. Can you do that for us? Thank you. Hi, everyone. When I think about my queer romance dream, I want to think specifically for a moment about trans literature. Because I remember the first time I read a novel following a trans character written by a trans author. And during a chase scene, when she skateboarded down a hill to get away from a team of vigilantes wearing power armor, I had to stop for a moment and try and figure out why my heart was racing. You see, I had never before really identified with a character that way. Not just empathized, but identified with her. How she talked, what her hobbies were, even how she went to queer sex parties where no one wanted to hook up with her. She seemed just like so many of my friends. She seemed like me. And when she was being chased by jockish brutes who wanted to beat her up for their idea of justice, I worried for her the same way I would worry if I got a text from a friend who was in trouble. And in the decades since I've read Supervillains by Alicia E. Gorenson, <laughs> I've been searching for more of that, as well as trying to create it myself. In the past few years, we've seen a flourishing of media telling trans stories, but the problem is that so much of it, unlike that novel, isn't actually a trans story. So much out there are actually cis stories about trans topics. Something I often put into the category of oh no narratives. These are the stories about a cis character who's suddenly thrust into a world of trans experience. Everything from oh no, my partner wants to transition. To oh no, my fiance was secretly trans. And oh no, space aliens have hit me with a gender swapping ray. And, oh no, my lover is a fourth dimensional being whose experience of gender is literally incomprehensible. 
It can all be summed up in a succinct tweet by at its supercar. Cis TV show about trans topics, my parent is transitioning. Trans TV show about trans topics, Psyker, psychic hacker fights cops. But lost in the comparison between the huge budget projects of Jill Soloway's Transparent and the Wachowski sisters' Sense8 is the fact that right now, more than any other time, there are low budget or even free options for getting your stories out there. And trans and genderqueer creators are taking advantage of that by the hundreds, perhaps even thousands. From authors selling smut on Amazon Kindle, or publishers publishing novels on Lulu, to webcomic artists and podcasters producing serialized stories that are free to access, there's a lot out there. But there are two problems. First, while tens of thousands can debate whether or not Steven Universe has trans characters, and millions will see or hear about Michelle Rodriguez's upcoming transploitation film. The followers of small-time trans creators often number in the hundreds, or even just the dozens. And secondly, without support of large publishers, trans authors lack the resources to pay themselves, let alone editors, proofreaders, web designers, PR consultants, or all the other roles that go into making a good story better and get it out into the world. After 10 years of self-publishing your work, you can't help but improve your craft, but it's still not the same as 10 years of feedback from professional editors. It's my dream that one day there will be enough well-known trans romance out there that I could focus specifically on this genre for a talk like this rather than having to draw examples from a variety of other genres and mediums. But for right now, we need to grow trans media as a whole. I wanna see websites devoted to cataloging our work and directing readers to the author's site for purchase. I want to see the handful of small trans-focused publishers popping up to grow and multiply and become a resource for trans authors just starting out. But all of that will take something from you. Your time, your dedication, and more often than not, your money. When creating trans work for trans audiences, we know that many of those who need our work the most don't have money to spend. And set our prices accordingly. An anthology of trans fiction by trans women of color offers free copies to all trans and non-binary people of color. Tori Peters has set up her own micro-publishing for her amazing novellas, The Masker and Infect Your Friends and Loved Ones, making eBooks available at sliding scale prices all the way down to zero. Ease Janeway publishes amazing, awesome smut simply on Tumblr, Fay Onyx is reimagining fairy tales following trans, genderqueer, and asexual characters in here stories, writing alchemy, and even reads those stories with ambient sound to you for free on a podcast. But that only works if there's someone paying full price. So please, seek out creators on Patreon, Smashwords, and everywhere else. I want you to watch her story. It's free on YouTube and the best trans romance I've seen or read anywhere. If You Were My Girl is incredible, and you can get it as a part of a free trial to Audible. Read The Black Cube and At Land by Morgan M. Page. Read everything by Charlie Jane Anders. Read books from Topside Press. I especially love A Safe Girl to Love by Casey Plett. And if you haven't read Nevada, what are you doing with your life? Go on to Patreon and support Manic Pixie Nightmare Girls, Sophie LaBelle, Amy Dentata, Kylie Wu, 30 Helens, and so many more. Pay double the full price if you can. And if you can't, tell all your friends to. And of course, sign the email list I'm going to send around or email thenewtranserotic at gmail.com to get information about my own anthology, Nerve Endings, coming out next Valentine's Day. And also email me, and I'll send you a list of all the works I mentioned in this talk. Because my dream for queer mo romance is both incredibly simple and world-changing.
I want trans creators to get paid at least as much as other creators and hopefully enough to keep doing this. Can we do that one more time for our dreamers today? Can we give them a big hand?